Um, let me start off with Ethiopia, and then I have quite a few humanitarian updates for you from around the world. Um, our humanitarian colleagues are telling us that they're aware of media reports of airstrikes in Tigray's northwest zone that took place yesterday, and that led to several civilian casualties, reportedly. However, we have not been able to confirm these reports, nor the number of casualties due to lack of communications in the area. <clears throat> As you saw in yesterday's statement by the Secretary General, he is indeed deeply concerned about the impact of the conflict that continues to have on civilians in Ethiopia. Our colleagues in Michele reported anti-aircraft fire this afternoon, but there's been no indication of bombardment of the city at this time. Uh, we, along with our humanitarian partners, have reduced movements in the northwest zone of Tigray following um, the airstrikes that took place Friday night, which reportedly killed more than 50 people and injured many others. We also continue to call on all parties to the conflict to immediately facilitate the free and sustained movement of humanitarian workers and supplies into Tigray, including medical supplies to treat civilians injured in recent attacks. The Secretary General reiterates his call for an immediate cessation of hostilities, including airstrikes, and for all parties to adhere to their obligations under international humanitarian law to facilitate humanitarian access and to ensure the protection of civilians, including humanitarian actors, premises, and sites. <clears throat> Today, our humanitarian... Um, Excuse me. Uh, in Geneva today, uh, we launched the Afghanistan Humanitarian Response Plan for 2022. The plan seeks $4.4 billion to reach 22 million people in need of life-saving humanitarian assistance across the country. The Afghanistan Regional Refugee Response Plan was also launched today and calls for $623 million to help 5.7 million displaced Afghans and local communities in five neighboring countries. The Emergency Relief Coordinator, Martin Griffiths, warned that a full-blown humanitarian catastrophe looms in the country and called on the world not to shut the door on the people of Afghanistan. Also today, the World Food Program said that with winter reaching its peak in the country, millions of people are at risk of starvation. WFP noted that half of the Afghan population is already acutely hungry and bad weather has now canceled flights and blocked roads, including the Salang Pass, a major gateway to the north of the country. WFP plans to reach 12 million people with food and nutrition support in January and is scaling up to assist more than 23 million people this year. For its part, the UN Children's Fund says it's deeply saddened by the killing of eight children in Nangahar province yesterday when an explosive remnant of war detonated near school. Four other children who had been attending class were also injured. All 12 were boys. UNICEF said the incident underlines how important it is for international community to support Afghanistan to clear explosive ordnance and remnants of war. Equally important is it, it is to educate children and their communities about the risks and preventive measures they must take. Uh, on Sudan, we also launched the Humanitarian Response Plan for 2022, which aims to reach 10.9 million vulnerable people at a cost of $1.9 billion. Nearly half of these funds will go towards life-saving activities. Sudan is experiencing increasing humanitarian needs, which are largely driven by the recession that started in 2018, as well as acute food insecurity, conflict, large-scale displacement, natural hazards, and the reduced delivery of social services and capacity to respond to disease outbreak, including the COVID-19 virus. The new humanitarian response plan will provide aid in such areas as health, the prevention of treatment of diseases, access to education, livelihoods, water, and sanitation. In 2021, aid workers reached more than 8.1 million people with some form of assistance in the country. This year, humanitarian organizations estimate that some 14.3 million men, women, and children across Sudan will need aid. This includes the Darfur region, where half of the people are estimated to be extremely vulnerable. Um, I think it was Ibtissam and a number of other people asked us for a humanitarian update on Syria and our operations. I can tell you that we're continuing to deliver aid to 3.4 million people in need in the Northwest through the Security Council authorized cross-border mechanism. Today, the start, uh, today marks the start of the second six months of the authorization 
under Resolution 2585, following issuance in December of the Secretary General's substantive report and ensuing discussions in the Security Council on the implementation of the resolution. The cross-border operation remains a lifeline for people in northwest Syria, providing food, water, and other essential humanitarian items for an average of 2.4 million people every month. Thousands of UN trucks cross each year into the remaining authorized, through the remaining authorized cross-border pro crossing at Bab el Hawa, and operations continue today unimpeded. Uh, the cross-border operation has been complemented by two UN cross-line convoys in 2021, providing aids from government-controlled parts of the country. As the Secretary General has said, cross-line deliveries cannot at this point replace the massive scale, up, scale of the cross-border operations, but they are very important. Both of these operations are essential to support the 3.4 million people who need help in the northwest of Syria. The, we continue to call on all parties to ensure safe, sustained, unimpeded access to all those in need and for, all, for the protection of civilians and civilian infrastructure in line with the obligations of under international humanitarian law of member states. Um, quick update from the Central African Republic where the UN peacekeeping mission there it is telling us that two people died and five more were injured during a violent demonstration which took place on the th in the third district of Bangui over the weekend. The mission deployed patrols in the area to ensure the protection of civilians and the situation is currently under control. Meanwhile, in Pawa in the Uwampende prefecture, armed combatants attacked the village of Zamari, including uh, injuring two civilians and burning several houses. The, peace, the UN peacekeepers remain on high alert in the area. The mission is currently assessing the situation to enhance the protection of civilians, despite the increased presence of landmines in the areas, which is limiting the mission's mobility. A quick update from Yemen, where the UN mission to support the Hudaida Agreement uh, has expressed its concern at the allegations of militarization of the Hudaida ports. The mission, as part of its mandate, has made a request to undertake an inspection, and it stands ready to address any concerns about the militarization of the ports. The mission reminds all parties that the ports are a crucial lifeline for millions of Yemenis. It calls on the parties to resolve this matter through uh, with restraint and preserve the civilian character of the port's infrastructure. And back here, the Security Council this morning, El Ghassim Wane, the head of the UN peacekeeping mission in Mali, said that every effort should be made to resolve the current challenges linked to the transition process as soon as possible. A protracted impasse will make it much harder to find a consensual way out, he warned, and will have far-reaching consequences for Mali and its neighbors. Against this political backdrop, he said that the, uh, the importance of the mission's priorities linked to the peace agreement and stabilization of the country's center region cannot be overemphasized. As the country is facing these difficult times, the special representative concluded, we observe a deep aspiration to reform, improve governance, and a more s effective state. Mali's partners should build on these aspirations to help lay the foundation for lasting stability. Quick note from Uganda, where a team there welcomed the reopening of schools in the country that took place yesterday. As you may know, this was the longest school closure due to COVID-19 anywhere in the world. Um, our team worked with authorities and partners on remote learning and on preparations for a safe reopening of these institutions. The resident coordinator, Suzanne Ngongi Namondo, acknowledged that challenges remain, and she called on national and international partners to work together to address these challenges with a renewed commitment from the UN team. From Bangladesh, the UN Children's Fund today said they're deeply they deeply grieved and stand in support of thousands of Rohingya refugees impacted by the fire that broke out recently in the refugee camps in Cox's Bazar, which also damaged uh, two UNICEF-supported learning centers. UNICEF and its partners on the ground have been working uh, since Sunday evening to help children and families by providing food, water, sanitation, clothing, and shelter material. And next door in Myanmar, uh, UNICEF also condemns the killing of at least four children and the maiming of multiple others during an escalation of conflict in the past week. The agency is, is gravely concerned by the stepped-up conflict in Myanmar and condemns the reported use of airstrikes and heavy weaponry in civilian areas and particularly outraged about attacks on children. 
Um, there's been a flurry of activity with the new year on the accounting department. Uh, our colleagues with the green visors have been counting, and letters have been sent to all member states informing them of their regular budget obligation and dues for 2022. Already, thanks to advanced payments applied for the year, four countries have already fully paid. We extend our thanks to Armenia, Kazakhstan, Nauru, and Ukraine for being the first countries on the honor roll. And I just um, want to end on a note to mark that one of our colleagues from the security services died unexpectedly yesterday. Captain Bill Ball was a 33-year veteran of the service prior to joining the UN. He served proudly in the US Marine Corps. Um, I first met Billy when um, he was on Secretary General Kofi Annan's security detail as the new kid on the block. He always made sure that I didn't miss a motorcade and I wasn't getting lost. He then rose through the ranks to become a supervisor. For the past few years, he was working the midnight shift, so not seen by many people. But like so many of his colleagues, worked in anonymity, keeping all of us safe in New York and around the world. I know I speak for many uh, throughout the UN system and in the spokesman's office when I say that he was a consummate professional with a big smile and a laugh that was as contagious as anything. Even after finishing the long stretch of the midnight shift, if you bumped into him on his way out, you could be sure he'd greet you with that smile and laugh of his. It hasn't been a day, but we miss him very much. Yes, James. Um, can I start then with your new statement on Ethiopia? Um, as with last week, uh, your statement is very even-handed, but the question is whether it's deservedly even-handed because there is only one group that has air power. You talk about all parties, but only one side has air power in, in, in Ethiopia. Should you not call out um, that one group? There, there is probably no doubt who is responsible for this attack. I, I don't think it's... Uh... I, I, I don't agree with your characterization. Um, um, we stand against uh, use of, of airstrikes. We stand against any targeting of civilians, of civilian infrastructure. And we have made that clear um, to all the parties. Two questions, if I can, on Kazakhstan. Um, first, has the Secretary General, I, I see um, uh, the uh, Kazakh mission has put out, a, and the Kazakh presidency has put out a list of people that the president of Kazakhstan has now talked to, an mm -hmm. array of, 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 of leaders around the world, um, some of them perhaps not close regional allies, like um, Viktor Orban, the prime minister of Hungary. Uh, has, the pro has the secretary general managed to speak to the president of uh, Kazakhstan? He has not. That seems rather odd, considering they must know each other very well. He was a former Under Secretary General, served for the UN in Geneva as di Director General there. Uh, they were two of the top officials in Geneva. They must know each other very well. Surely the Secretary General has tried to place a call into some, to uh, someone he wants, to, he knows very well, and and could have influence. Uh, I wouldn't characterise. Uh, I mean, they they know they've they, uh, they he knows him. Um, We've had contacts uh, through various levels, including through our special representative and the mission here. And the second question on Kazakhstan is about those helmets. Um, yeah. You said that you were seeking cl clarification yeah, from yeah. the Kazakh mission. Mm -hmm. Shortly after you spoke 24 hours ago, the Kazakh mission put out a tweet which says, except for the helmets that were worn as part of the official gear of local peacekeepers during the high threat, no UN marked equipment was used. I mean, what's your reaction to the fact that they're saying, apart from the helmets, well, when, mean, they, when the helmet is, right. the, is the key no, we, bit of identifiable gear of a uh, UN we've, peacekeeper? We've, we've, made, we've made that clear to them, that they can, you know, they cannot, no country can use UN-branded equipment, whether it's a helmet or armoured personnel carrier or, or anything else, uh, outside of a security, UN Security Council-mandated mission. They, they have told us uh, that they have addressed... Uh, this issue. And is there any action you can take? I don't know if there are Kazakh peacekeepers currently I don't serving. Know. I mean, we've 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 uh, expressed our our um, our opinion very clearly to them, uh, and we have not since then. We have not received any other any reports um, that UN marked uh, equipment has been used in any way or seen. Edie. Uh, thank you, Steph. A couple of questions. Uh, first. Uh, there was another missile launch by North Korea last night. Mm -hmm. uh, does the Secretary General have any comment? Look, uh, 
we've obviously seen um, uh, this launch. Uh, we're very concerned. The Secretary General is very concerned uh, by this latest uh, development and reiterates his call on the leadership in the DPRK to comply fully with its international obligations under all relevant Security Council resolutions and to resume talks with the other parties concerned about the situation on the Korean Peninsula. As we've said again, we are convinced and believe that diplomatic engagement is the only way uh, to reach a sustainable peace and a complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. Um, a couple of other follow-ups. Uh, mm -hmm. First, on uh, Kazakhstan, um, can you tell us what the UN team on the ground is actually doing? Sure. I mean, the, obviously, there was some concern about uh, ensuring that everybody was safe. Everybody is safe. Um, the, the, you've got two, bit, two presidents. You've got the Afghanistan back office, which is doing its work. Uh, the UN country team has a country program. Obviously, they are looking at the programmatic impact of what's happened on the ground uh, to, their, to their work. And thirdly, um, the uh, government-backed uh, uh, forces in Yemen have retaken a key southern uh, province. Um, does the Secretary General have any comment on that and what actually is being done about trying to promote uh, sure. I mean, we're, we're, we're concerned about the latest uh, reports of, of fighting, uh, which can only have a negative impact on the already extremely dire humanitarian situation uh, in Yemen. We're seeing points of tension, whether it's around that ship, whether it's uh, that we had talked about, the, whether it's around uh, Hudaydah. Um, Mr. Gunberg uh, is... Uh, ongoing number of consultations outside of the region. He just concluded a visit to the UK today. Um, he met with a number of uh, senior UK officials, including the Minister for Middle East and North Africa at the Foreign and Commonwealth Development Office. Uh, discussions included the deteriorating economic situation, as well as the recent military escalation and its impact on prospects of reaching a peaceful and just resolution to the conflict. Senora, you've been waving your hand. Yes, that's on. okay. Hi, Stefan. Um, Nicaragua had their uh, presidential um, ceremony. Um, Daniel Ortega was sworn in for the fourth uh, time. Um, what is the reaction from the Secretary General after um, questioning uh, of the elections by the United States, the European Union, they just sanctioned over 116 members of the government of Ortega. Um, at least 100,000 people have fled the country since the protests in 2018, and 170 people is still detained as political prisoners. Um, is any message the secretary wants to send um, to Ortega, especially after the report? Well, I, I think the, the message is to a continued concern about uh, the arbitrary detention, a uh, number of people that we saw prior to the election, which appears, as far as I know, uh, to, be, uh, uh, to be continuing. It's important that all those people have been arbitra arbitrarily um, detained uh, be, uh, be released, and, and we encourage the government to, on the human rights front, to cooperate uh, with relevant human rights mechanism, including um, the, human rights, uh, the Human Rights Council. Just a follow-up, does the Secretary General has any concerns or has any um, idea of what could happen after the election. Now we're talking about he has five more years in power, and it doesn't seem that he is uh, willing to do any changes. So far, he just had made a, um, a statements that showed that he will continue to do what he's doing. He actually doesn't show any kind well, of... Well, can't, I can't predict what the, the future will hold. We, we want for Nicaragua, as any other place on, on Earth, a, a country where people's aspirations are met and where is, there's, there is a space for healthy debate uh, and space for civil society. Uh, thank you, Steph. Um, Michelle Bachelet in the summer announced that she will put together a report about... Um, 
human rights violations in China's uh, Xinjiang region. Mm -hmm. Still now, there is no report. I keep on hearing that it's uh, delayed and it will be maybe further delayed. Do you have any date or any, um, do you know when it might uh, be published and how it will be published? Uh, short answer is no. I mean, uh, we can you should place a call to our colleagues in, in Geneva. They would be the ones controlling the, the timing. How, whether it's a verbal presentation, whether it's a written report, I think you should ask them. And I'm happy to ask them as well. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, Steph. Uh, this morning we have seen a statement issued by uh, Human Rights Commission in Geneva regarding Tunisia. What does uh, do you expect from Tunisia if in regard this issue? Also, can we expect more pressure, more steps from the United Nations if Tunisia refuses to release the former Justice Minister Al Buhairi? Look. Uh I have no, it's not for me to comment what the Human Rights uh, Council, I assume, uh, has said. We are uh, present in, in Tunisia and would uh, uh, do whatever we can to accompany um, Tunisia on a, on a road to, uh, to democracy. Yeah. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, there are many battles in Yemen between uh, military forces from the south and the uh, Houthi militias, which led to the liberation of uh, Shabwa province. How does the UN uh, see these developments uh, on the ground? Thank I think, you. as I mentioned to to Edie, we're we're concerned about the renewed uh, the renewed fighting. Uh, the first victims of the fighting are the civilians. Uh, it continues to make our humanitarian work that much more complicated. Uh, that much more difficult uh, to deliver aid to those who, who need it. And it just prolongs the years-long suffering of the Yemeni people. And we would encourage people to rally around the efforts of Hans Gunberg and the United Nations uh, to bring about peace and stability uh, to Yemen. Dulce. Thank, thanks. Um, given that the term of Undersecretary General uh, Anna Menendez as senior policy advisor has not been extended, as of December 31st. What is the status of that post and the staff in, of the people in her office, including the senior gender advisor? Thanks. Uh, we will, I expect an announcement on, uh, on that uh, post in the, coming, uh, in the coming, coming days, hopefully. And on Central African Republic, did you say who shot the protesters? Who killed the protesters? Uh, let's see. Was I listening to what I was saying? Were you listening to what uh, I was saying? I, let yeah, me, <laughs> I, I, I thought I was listening. <laughs> let, me, uh, let me remind myself what I said on the Central African Republic. Uh, no, it's not clear. Uh, we do know that two people died and there was live, um, live fire. Uh, the peacekeepers deployed in the area, uh, but I'll see if our peacekeeping colleagues have any more details. Thank you. And to, just to remind you that Hans Grunberg is briefing the Security Council uh, tomorrow. Uh, Abdel Hamid. Thank you, Stefan. I have also a couple of questions. Um, can you confirm that Mr. Dimistura is arriving tomorrow in Rabat, and can you share with us more information about his uh, plans to work please? No, the short answer is no. As soon as I have something official from his office, I will share it with you. And in a related to ask you before, a uh, number of violations including the killing of the three Mauritanians, and I have not received any answer about that. I, I didn't hear what, where, where do you, I, I, oh, on the Western Sahara. Okay, let me, it's a good point. Let me, I need to, to pull some strings on that one. Okay, uh, Mushfik, please. Can I get a question, please? Go ahead, go ahead, Abdul Hamid. Okay, sorry. Uh, both Morocco and Saudi Arabia are beginning to send back to China some Uyghur activists. Are you aware of this uh, case? And do you know what kind of fate they will receive if they are shipped back to China? I will. It was Morocco, and what was the other country? And Saudi Arabia. 
Let, let me uh, let, let me check on that. I will check on that. Uh, Mushfik. Thank, thank you, Stefan. Uh, in the in Bangladesh, in the name of local government election, a catastrophe is going on. Within fifth phase election, fifth phase steps election completed, and 86 people were killed. So, do you are aware of that? And what is uh, what you will say on behalf of the Secretary General as? Uh, in the name of local government election, people are killing and main of opposition party boycotting this local government election. And I'm, my second we, question... Yeah, go ahead. Would you have any update? Would you please give, any, and give me any update as so, I ask? As, as soon as I have something, I will give that to you. Uh, on on the, the election violence, we, of course, deplore any uh, any loss of life, and we always believe elections... Uh, should be held in the most uh, peaceful climate as possible anywhere in the world. Uh, James. Um, question, but first a request. Um, Mr. Grunberg is briefing. Um, Mr. De Mastura is traveling. It would be nice to, I mean, they can brief from anywhere these days yeah. with Zoom so we've, or whatever. Uh, We'd like to speak to both of them. All right, we've, we'll ask uh, Mr. Grunberg. I don't believe Mr. De Mastura will speak until uh, he finishes the tour as soon as we've announced that it starts. OK, um, a clarification from yesterday. I'm asking again about this, but I'm still confused about your COVID guidance. You said yesterday you are sticking with the 10 days of mm -hmm. isolation versus the CDC's new advice mm -hmm. of five days and you can just stay away for five mm -hmm. days and if you feel better, come back after five days without a test. Why has the UN decided now to part ways with the CDC? Because throughout the pandemic... I mean, in the first year and, and, and in the second year, you have been saying, well, here at UN headquarters, we must follow the host country and the host city and their guidance. Now you're not. No, I think we're just playing a little bit, uh, a little bit safer and uh, overabundance of, of caution. Obviously, these, these regulations are being looked at almost daily. And if we feel they, they'll shift, they will shift. And who makes that decision? It's, uh, it's a recommendation done by the occupational, it's, I, I will not use the acronym, but the, the, the Occupational Safety uh, Committee, which... OK, because I was going to ask medical, a related question. Service. of emer uh, the, uh, Do you now have a UN medical director here, a new one? Uh, yes, we have a medical... Uh, Bernard Leonard, who was the deputy director, is now the medical director. Is, and that was announced, was it? I mean, it wasn't announced because it's just... Uh, at all, I mean... Okay. What, but it's it's a fact. Okay. Fine. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes, Dulcie. Yeah. Uh, does the Secretary General or any top UN official have a comment on the 20th anniversary of Guantanamo Bay? I think the the UN system as a whole has expressed its reservations and its concerns about uh, what has been going on in Guantanamo Bay and the the, the need for. Um, for all member states uh, anywhere around the world to respect uh, international human rights and their obligations. Thank you. Okay. Uh, 